So another way that um, scientists can think about mutation is if genes are not being properly regulated. And the misexpression of an organism's genes can also lead to what we could call mutation. So an important class of genes um, that are often invoked when talking about this kind of regulatory mutation are homeotic genes, or Hox genes, which are um, a series of genes that govern the segmental identity or the polarity of an organism. Where's your head? Where's your tail? You know, what are all the parts in between? And what are they supposed to be growing or doing? So bringing us back to tonight's movie, here's a fruit fly. Close. And we can see that fruit flies have different body parts, different segmental identities. You're supposed to be growing antenna out of your head. You're supposed to be growing wings out of your thorax. And you're supposed to be growing the appropriate types of legs out of these appropriate body segments. Now, if these homeotic genes are misregulated and misexpressed in the wrong place or at the wrong time, you can end up with what we call homeotic transformations, such as an extra pair of wings instead of a pair of legs. Or this is everyone's favorite, um, legs where your antenna should be. <laughs> and that's the really cool one, so here's a better picture. Um, legs, antenna, legs. Now, not only Drosophila fruit flies have these types of genes, these are conserved in all organisms, well, in most organisms, from sea anemones, which really, they have polarity? Yes, they do. All the way up to um, higher mammals, such as humans, have these, these homeotic genes. For we too have polarity and segmental identity. Um, the most common type of homeotic transformation in human beings is probably an extra pair of ribs growing out of a vertebra where they should not be. And this is fairly common, about one in 10 adults may have an extra set of ribs. And no, it's not specific for men or women. All right, so back to thinking about this for a second. Hmm. OK, so this can't happen. <laughs> um, but thinking about this does raise a few legitimate scientific questions, such as, um, is it possible to express genes from one organism in another? Yes. And if you do that, do the proteins that that organism makes actually work? Are they functional proteins? And in many, many cases, yes. So I just want to talk about a few examples of this um, before you get to move on to the movie. So one example, since we talked about Hox genes, this is a paper that was published in 1996 in which they showed that you could replace a Drosophila Hox gene with the orthologous gene from a chicken. And it would work just fine. Um, it worked just fine even though the last common ancestor of these two organisms was 670 million years ago. That's pretty amazing. But what makes that possible is our genetic code is universal. Um, every organism on Earth from the lowliest, cutest bacteria up to humans and more advanced creatures um, the same three RNA letters will give you the same amino acid when you're making a protein. I find that extremely amazing. And what this allows is for us to manipulate things to help treat human disease, for one thing, and also to learn lots of cool things about science. Um, so recombinant DNA technology, for example, which uh, came around in the mid-1970s, allowed us to take genes from humans and make proteins that sick people need in other organisms, such as bacteria. So for example, we can take human genes, insert them into tiny pieces of DNA, and then introduce those DNA molecules into bacteria. The bacteria will replicate that human DNA along with their own, and you can actually get them to make proteins from that human DNA. That you can then purify that protein and use it to treat human disease. And a really well-known example of this is insulin to treat diabetes. Um, before this type of technology was available, insulin was purified largely from cow or pig pancreases um, with varying results. A more recent example of a gene from one organism that is being widely used and expressed in other organisms is the gene encoding green fluorescent protein which is originally isolated from this jellyfish. 
and it earned a Nobel Prize in Chemistry for these gentlemen in 2008. So since this gene and this protein product earned a Nobel Prize, you can be assured that it is important for many, many applications, which I don't have time to talk to you about tonight. But I just wanted to show you that you can express this gene and make the protein successfully in fruit flies, parts of mice, whole mice, bunnies. And you can have another form of GFB, the green fluorescent pig. Okay. So what about this? <laughs> Now, is it so strange that Jeff Goldblum is making fly digestive enzymes? Uh, no. What is strange is that his entire physiology would change as an adult organism. But the, the digestive enzyme part is not so mysterious. If we look at the, the human genome, we can easily find several digestive enzymes, such as these five here, um, that we have in common with fly. Uh, we don't have a, a genome sequence for the common house fly yet, but we do have a genome sequence for a fruit fly. So if we look, for example, um, for the protein sequence of trypsin, we can compare the protein sequence of trypsin from a human to a fruit fly, and with odds of 9 times 10 to the negative 46 against of this happening by chance, these are the same protein, and they are functionally equivalent. One just happens to work on the inside and one on the outside, as you are about to see. So that's all I have time to talk to you about tonight. Um, I hope you've learned a little bit about the connection between DNA and proteins and what scientists mean when they talk about mutation. And enjoy the film, and I'd be happy to take a couple of questions. That's why I decided to not use it because it would give the wrong impression of what mutation actually is, even though it's a really cool picture. Yeah. Yeah. Are there examples of more complicated um, expressions of uh, one species gene in another species? Uh, the short answer would be yes. Um, I can't think of a good concrete example. I mean, the other, the other thing I thought about including in this talk is the fact that we can mate closely related species and produce a, a, a viable offspring. The <laughs> offspring itself is sterile, but it will express genes from, from both organisms. Um, in the simplest case, you can think of a donkey and a horse making a mule or a... Um, but yeah, it's possible to get more complicated. But it's not like you can take the genes that make an elephant trunk and put those genes into a mouse and the mouse will make yeah. You talked a little bit about uh, protein folding, um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, folding at home or these other sort of crowdsourced protein folding. What is specifically what are they trying to solve in those protein folding problems? Right. So we've known since the early 1960s that if you you have this same sequence of amino acids in the same order will spontaneously, in most cases, fold up into the same functional structure. And if you perturb that sequence, you perturb that structure, you perturb that function. We've known that for a very long time. What scientists have been unable to make predictions about is, is if you just give, give us random sequence of amino acids, what structure will that adopt? Um, there are no hard and fast rules. We can predict what will happen for small pieces of it. But we can't just, for example, you can plug in an RNA sequence and spit out the sequence of amino acids. You can't plug in an amino acid sequence into a computer and spit out a structure. And people have been trying to do this computationally for a long time. There are a lot of computers running, running overtime trying to sort this out. But really, what's best at figuring it out is humans and gamers playing around with it. So this uh, video game version of protein folding that you can download and play with, you get to experience for yourself 
how different amino acids might interact with different amino acids, how that might fit together, how certain parts of the protein might need to collapse to fill in this space or expand to make a, an active site over here. So this is something that we really need more than just computational power. We really need human intuition to get to the solution. And I don't know if we'll ever have a formula that will solve this. All right, one last question. Anyone? Yeah. Um, will there ever come a point where we can, like a person having a baby could choose the traits in their baby by altering the... the <laughs> um, I'm really I didn't know. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't know what made you think of that, but um, I mean we already are to the point where you can easily choose the, the gender of your baby, right? I mean, right? Like eyes and hair color. Eye color, you hair want color. To be a bodybuilder, you know, certain <laughs> muscle muscle mutations. We know the more and more we know about genomes and proteins, the more we know about what it would take to have certain traits in a child. Um, in most countries, it's illegal to, to do those kinds of things, which is probably a really good thing. Um, and so it's going to really not be a matter of if we can do it, but who's regulating if we're allowed to do it. So we're not quite to Gattaca yet, but we're on our way. Okay. All right, thank you very much.